And I hope that after, you know, engaging in this conversation, folks that are listening are thinking about the systemic work that needs to be done as well. Because it is not just left to the principal to figure out how she can decompress and do self-care. There are real systemic gaps and challenges that will continuously make her job unbearable. And so what can we do to lighten that load, to mitigate some of those barriers? That's really the call to action. Welcome to Leading Voices, a podcast brought to you by WestEd, a national nonprofit, nonpartisan research development and service agency. This podcast highlights WestEd's leading voices, shaping innovations and developing equity-driven supports for schools and communities across the country. My name is Danny Torres. I'll be your host. Today, we're here with Dr. Aaron Browder. Dr. Browder provides technical assistance and project design for K-12 initiatives relating to trauma-informed topics, school improvement, systems change, leadership development, social-emotional learning, and culturally responsive and equity-centered approaches that foster safe and supportive schools. She also works for the National Center to Improve Social and Emotional Learning and School Safety and for a number of federally funded projects at WestEd. Our focus for today's episode, Sustaining Educational Leaders of Color. Dr. Browder, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, Danny. Now, before we dive into today's topic, let our listeners know how you came to this work. I started my teaching career in an elementary classroom in East Harlem, New York City. Uh, before returning home to Los Angeles, which is my home, um, where I worked in comprehensive middle and high schools as a school improvement facilitator. And that work in particular, I would say, led me on the path to where I am today. As a school improvement facilitator, I had no idea what, what I was being tasked with. I thought my work was simply, you know, providing professional development so that educators could better support the needs of students. And what I learned was so much more. It exposed me to the different ways that school sites are impacted by systems, systems policies, and even in particular, the role of the principal. As a school improvement facilitator, I had a tangential role to the school leadership team. And there I was able to see the particular needs and challenges of school leaders that they face both as individuals and then as a member of a larger system. It led me to some essential questions that I continue to look for answers today. And that is how do we hold our systems accountable? How do we monitor the ways that our systems are causing harm? And what can we do to mitigate that impact and to create systems that actually fulfill the promises that they've been tasked with? And so providing safe and supporting learning spaces for our students and the adults that serve them is a critical part of my work. And then how do we support our leaders who support those adults? Now, the pandemic surfaced enduring systemic problems. Some of your recent work sheds light on some of this and on challenges related to sustaining education leaders, particularly education leaders of color. Can you first talk a little bit about this idea of shifting focus from retaining educators to sustaining educators? Sure. You know, I would first offer an invitation for all of us to pause and just really ponder the definition of retain versus sustain, right? So when we think of the terms retain, we're thinking of keeping, holding in place, protecting, safeguarding, right? Retaining retention. So let's hold that in one hand. And then on the other hand, when we think of the term sustain, we have a much softer response. It's almost physical that we can feel more open hearted and open minded about the different ways that we can support and really resource our educators and leaders of color in particular. And I I name that because there's um, pretty consistent rhetoric around the retention of leaders of color. I will say that retention can feel like it's objectifying educators, it's objectifying leaders of color, and sustaining opens us up to a space where we're nurturing, we're supporting, we're, you know, watering and really growing the talent that comes from our educators and leaders of color. 
And so that's the space that we want to be, especially if we want them to create that environment for our students and those learning conditions for our students. My sense is that this idea of sustaining educators is empowering, and I really, really appreciate it. What sort of challenges do teachers and leaders of color face on the daily? Can you offer some examples for our listeners? There's two key players here. We have our systems. And so our systems, those are these larger entities that we report to, that we engage within, that we take direction from, that we feel supported by. And then we have our interpersonal relationships, right? So on a school site, that could be between teachers, that could be between a leader and a teacher, so on and so forth. At a school site, a leader is tasked with enforcing systemic policies at the school level, as are teachers as well. In both of these, as individuals and as systems, we all hold accountability to creating climates that educators and leaders of color can thrive. Bringing it back to where we're focused on, our systems, more often than not, are informed by a white dominant culture. What does that mean? What does it look like? That means the culture of perfectionism, the worship of the written word, right? These are widely held understandings of the ways that we're impacted by whiteness on the daily. And it doesn't require white folks to enforce white dominant culture. In many ways, it lives inside of all of us um, in the ways that we relate and connect to each other and to the world. Race is prominent, but it is not the only way that we experience culture and identities in our systems. And so when we're investigating as a system, when we're examining the ways that we're causing harm, there's questions that we ask ourselves of who's being excluded, who's being harmed, who's being included, who's shaping the policies, who's deciding where resources and monies go. And those are systemic conversations that we all are a part of, whether we know it or not. And on the individual level, the ways that we are showing respect and trust to each other. So thinking of particular examples, You know, leaders of color observe different challenges or conflicts on their campus. They report it to districts and they're dismissed. These are general understandings that have been imparted on me from folks that I work with in the field. Um, So feeling like your concerns are dismissed, feeling that your values are aren't shared by the larger system, feeling passed up that you're not getting opportunities or, or authentic, meaningful support feeling like the support that you are getting is actually causing you more harm. Some leaders of color report that their supervisors, their principal supervisors or folks who are mentoring them, either from the district, sometimes districts higher out, are actually uh, surveilling them, right? That they're Mm -hmm. like being overly monitored and policed about their language and their actions and their behaviors. They're being questioned publicly. You know, someone confided in me that their principal supervisor is at their campus so often that the kids are like, is everything okay? Mm -hmm. Right. This idea of understanding the challenges requires uplifting the voices of those who are the most impacted. So we need to be doing empathy interviews if you want to throw a TA, a, a technical assistance term there, or literally just talking and having open conversations and asking questions about ways that um, school leaders are feeling undersupported and unseen in their districts. Another thing that I hear are folks feel underappreciated and uncelebrated. So these are people that are carrying, you know, all principles right now, inclusive of race and gender and, and sexual orientation and ability. Everyone is really experiencing a tumultuous time during the pandemic, post-pandemic, principals were the folks that were in the school site at the beginning of the pandemic, even once the schools closed, right? They have never stopped going. And for principals of color, that's in addition to the different tasks that they've been given, where often they feel like they're doing more than their peers. And so that might mean emotional support to your teachers. That might mean individual, like reaching out to parents and families that might mean following up on a complaint that was made by a student against a teacher. So there's all these little tasks 
It's not that these tasks are specific for education leaders of color. It's that they're all happening at the same time and that there's very little relief. And that when we start to examine the roles of our systems and the culture that they're upholding, there's people that feel most supported. And those are people who have the identities that are celebrated and that are embraced by that dominant culture. When we think about our systems and holding them accountable, it falls on the shoulders of our leaders of color in most cases when the systems are not doing the things that they're supposed to do. Because our, our leaders of color are being uber resourceful, making sure they're either outsourcing the translation needs or they're doing it themselves. They're staying late. And again, I've worked with white female principals. I've worked with male principals, male principals of, of different colors. And there are some unique challenges that I see across those identities. And we're not saying that folks aren't doing one or some of these, but not all at the same time, typically how our ed leaders of color are experiencing it. Can you describe the conditions of the schools leaders of color are often assigned to? There is research that shows that a majority of leaders of color are placed in high need schools, mm. right? And so for all of us that are working in this space, we already have an understanding. It might be a minimal, it might be a large understanding of what a high need school requires of a school leader. And I'll say I had a, a colleague who um, shared with me about the high need school that she was placed in where she says, Aaron, everything was high needs in that school. The literal building, the teachers, the students, the parents, the community, and that she was so exhausted every day that even hugging kids was tiring. Honestly, I feel like my eyes are like blowing up. Like that, that is such a hard truth to acknowledge that hugging and being in relationship with kids is what is rewarding and what restores us. But in a space where you're constantly operating in a depleted fashion, where things are always like at their point of falling apart, like at what point do you, you know, give in? At what point do you tap out? And I'll offer this as well, you know, just bringing this back to what we talked about before. Again, what are the systemic accountabilities? Because this leader of color, a multiracial woman was not pointing fingers at the school community or the teachers or the students. She, if anything, felt inept that she couldn't keep up with the demand of the work, which is heartbreaking on another level too. But what did her system, what did her district put into place to support her being there and support the needs of the individuals like in that space? And oftentimes, you know, we're pointing fingers at individuals and there's some systemic responsibilities and change that needs to occur to better support the school sites. And then obviously the ways that our district and central offices are ran and the policies that we're enacting. So what kind of support can we provide? What does your work look like and how can we make change? How can we make systemic change? Well, hold on. Let me get my magic wand out of my bag. <laughs> Yes, um, if it could be that simple. Yes. <laughs> research shows that it takes four to seven years for systemic change to mm. to fully form and like really start to have that promise of sustainability, which feels like it's working against us given you know the terms of superintendents and just the shifts in curriculum and like different ways that the outside world and state policies impact what's happening in a single classroom. As someone who's been engaged in this work for well over 10 years, the first truth, the universal truth that I think I named already is the answers are in the room, right? Mm -hmm. So as we're identifying solutions, speaking to those who are most impacted are going to be the puzzle pieces we need to help us, you know, define what solutions or strategies are going to be the most effective. And so that means, again, open-hearted, open-minded, interviewing, asking people questions, reserving judgment. And 
also, you know, having a core group of partners who are down for the cause, right? Mm -hmm. That are like completely engaged, who understand that there will be moments of discomfort, but have committed to the vision, a shared vision. So you're not just promoting one person's individual agenda, but there's a collective identity and multiple people are holding it. When you have a group of people, oftentimes for this work, this equitable systems change work, you are called to the table and you're working with a group that has been going in circles Mm -hmm. and they're like not finding their way through. And so making sure that they're anchored in whatever this shared vision is and then building some shared understanding and language so that they can engage and understand that when I use the term equity and you use the term equity, we mean the same thing. And so making what's unknown known as a group, building a culture that sustains leaders of color is a systemic effort. It is not the work of one person. That's also why when that one person leaves, the work leaves, Mm. right? It has to live in that space. It's really important to have a trusted partner. And oftentimes that's someone who does not come from the system, but someone who values, obviously, the system partners as partners, as collaborators, as co-developers and co-conspirators in the larger work that y'all are engaging in. So it's not just me coming and supplanting and kind of having my agenda. This is the one, two, three step way that you're going to solve this challenge. No, it is a multi-step process and it needs to have legs or connectors to different folks that are experiencing this problem. Why does it matter in your district that leaders of color are healthy and they're sustained? What does it look like, feel like, sound like when leaders of color are healthy and sustained? And what we'll find is that our white leaders are also likely not sustained as well. And so when we center this group that has perhaps in most cases experienced the most inequities, everyone will benefit from that attention and that work that's being done. So it's not coming in with scripts and surveys and tools. You're really getting to know the people that you're working with. It's a very, very human process. I wonder who you start with. Do you start with the superintendent? Do you start with the school board? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, I think it's different for different projects, of course. Um, And so in some cases, we've had superintendents, assistant superintendents who come to us that are stewarding this work or tasked with facilitating it by their board. In other places, we have directors or superintendents of equity um, who are also looking for some additional support um, because even in those roles, they're feeling isolated or just like not supported or heard as they're advocating for different things. And, and it comes down to, you know, mobilizing groups of people. And the people you're working with, they bring their own trauma. They bring their own personal experiences to the work. So while changing the system, there also has to be, in my mind, some individual supports that help the leaders you're working with, right? Definitely. Those safeguards are critical, Mm -hmm. not just for burnout. All students benefit from, you know, healthy and thriving adults, from cultural awareness and, and culturally affirming environments. And I really embrace the conversation around culturally inf- and affirming environments. It's also language that's starting to be used more in the recruitment of a diverse workforce because it's very proactive. Well, Dr. Browder, it's been a real pleasure talking with you today. Are there any last thoughts you'd like to share with our audience? Yes, I have several, but I'm just going to share a couple. Um, the first is after you've listened to this podcast, Do a stock take, you know, who are you in relationship with? Who might you know very little about, especially thinking about our educators, our education leaders of color? How might you deepen your relationship or connection to them in a way that feels sincere and not forced? On a larger systemic level, create space for your ed leaders of color colleagues to share and inform conversations or to drive conversations in spaces where they've typically been silenced or silent. Look for opportunities to engage and invite folks to collaborate 
um, who offer different perspectives in ways that don't tokenize them, but also listen to their solutions as well as their experiences and their pain points. But I hope that after, you know, engaging in this conversation, folks that are listening are thinking about the systemic work that needs to be done as well, because it is not just left to the principal to figure out how she can decompress and do self-care. There are real systemic gaps and challenges that will continuously make her job unbearable. And so what can we do to lighten that load, to mitigate some of those barriers? That's really the call to action. And even as we engage in conversations about well-being, we have to have a systemic lens and not only focus on the individual themselves. I would say there's a a group that does that really well, the Center for Black Educator Development, that offers strategies of support for individuals, but then also call in to question, you know, different systemic practices that are working against the well-being and the success of the folks on the ground. Great. Yeah, yeah. We'll put a link to their website in the show notes. Are there any other resources you could recommend to our listeners? Yeah, I mean, we have a couple, a few here at West Ed, just to name some, the first podcast with Christina Paid, talking about educator well-being. There's definitely application for the leader context as well. We have resources that have been published through the SEL Center that definitely fall in line uh, with doing this work, both on a systems and individual level. The work of my colleague, David Lopez and John Jacobs, on the systemic equity reviews. The systemic equity reviews are great tools to better understand where one's districts, like where a district starting point is. And so having that data in front of you tells a story and it helps to build the understanding of equity in a particular place. That's an important uh, resource. Great, thank you. Yeah, we'll put uh, links to Christina's conversation, to the Cell Center website, and to the Systemic Equity Review webpage in this episode's show notes. Dr. Browder, thank you very, very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk with me today, and thank you very much for your leadership in this work. Where can our listeners find you online? So uh, listeners can contact me on my West Ed bio page. Uh, they can also find me on Twitter at Aaron the Educator, and that's E R I N, and then the Educator after uh, is my handle. Great. We'll put a link to your bio and your Twitter handle in the show notes as well. Again, thank you very, very much. And thanks to our listeners for joining us. All the resources mentioned in this podcast will be available online at wested.org forward slash leading voices podcast or in the show notes on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. For more information about West Ed's systemic equity review services, visit us online at wested.org forward slash S-E-R. This podcast is brought to you by West Ed, a national nonprofit, nonpartisan research development and service agency. At West Ed, we believe that learning changes lives. Every day, we partner with schools and communities across the country to improve outcomes for youth and adults of all ages. Today's episode focused on one really important facet of the work that we do at WestEd, and I encourage you to visit us at wested.org to learn more. And a special thanks to Tanisha Bell, content manager for the Leading Voices podcast, and to Sanjay Pardanani, our audio producer. Join us next time on the Leading Voices podcast. Thank you very much. Until next time.